Hello everybody, welcome to our international physics webinar and today it's our 282nd international physics webinar. Today we have with us Professor Dr. Nancy Fordy uh, from uh, University of Simon Fraser University, Canada and she has already connected with us. So good morning, madam. Your part is uh, uh, now morning and uh, our part is <laughs> almost uh, midnight, so it's 11.30. So thanks for joining with us, and it's our honor and privilege to host you, madam. So uh, dear viewers, I think you have already come to know the title of this today's uh, interesting webinar, and the title is Touching When You Can't See, and Technologies for Manipulating Biology at the Nanoscale. I think you will enjoy it. So before going to her, I would like to introduce her with you. So uh, Nancy, Professor Nancy Fordy actually completed her bachelor degree from uh, Toronto University and uh, her MSc and PhD degree from Chicago University. And uh, we can see uh, her research interest in mechanical properties of the extracellular matrix protein uh, and other things, development of high uh, throughput single molecule force spectroscopy measurement and development of the optical trapping strategies and mechanism of novel molecular motors. So I think you will enjoy. So madam, uh, it's your part. You can start your session. And Excellent. All right. Thank you so much. And thanks for coming. Um, yeah, so I am joining you today from Simon Fraser University, which is uh, right near um, downtown Vancouver, uh, British Columbia on the west coast of Canada. And um, our university is located on the traditional and unceded territories of the Squamish, the tsleil and the Musqueam nations. And so we are working towards a better understanding of our history and um, cultures of these indigenous peoples of Canada. As you can see, uh, SFU is located on top of a, a mountain well, it, it looks like a hill compared to the nearby mountains, but it's called a mountain. And if we were to zoom in to the, to the university, uh, we would see the physics department and we would also see our new um, observatory. And one thing I love about our observatory is there's a science courtyard outside that has these um, plaques on the, on the surface here, and they represent powers of 10 in dimensions. And so from one end to the other, we go from the smallest length scales to the largest length scales in the universe. So starting from way down here, the electroweak unification to the largest scales along here. And um, where I work is right in the middle, uh, pretty close to the middle anyway, on the log scale, um, mostly thinking about things at the molecular size scales and um, sort of nanometer size scales. So to orient all of us to what it is, the types of, of systems I study, I thought I would show a video um, from CERN. And this is zooming in to a hair. So taking a picture of a hair and we're gonna zoom in closer and closer and closer and see the structure. So there's individual hairs with their cells on the surface and the rough dimension, there's a scale bar at the bottom. And if we zoom in, you can see the remnants of the cells that formed the hair. They're on the order of 10 micrometers. Zooming in further, you can see these sort of thread-like or rope-like structures within them. And if you were to be able to keep zooming in, you would see they're made up of yet smaller structures, which in turn are hierarchically assembled from smaller ordered structures. Now we're getting down to sort of the nanometer widths of these things. Here's an individual protein. In this case, it's called keratin. And that's the fundamental molecular building block of hair. And proteins are made up of individual atoms, predominantly carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, and hydrogen. And of course, if we were to keep going, we would see the components of those individual atoms, the electrons, and zooming in, we'd eventually get down to the size scale of the nucleus. We'd have some ways to go. And um, having reached the nucleus, we would then continue to zoom in 
and eventually you see that there are quarks uh, making up the nucleus, um, well, making up the protons and so on in the nucleus, right? So this gives you a, an idea, I hope, an orientation to the length scales. And what I'm interested in in my research group are proteins and uh, understanding the properties of proteins. So they're made up of these atoms, make up the proteins, make up our bodies, and we're trying to understand them, okay? So in the video, looking at human hair, um, we saw that the fundamental protein that makes this up is called keratin. In uh, my research group, we don't look at keratin. We thought about it. It would be interesting, I think. But uh, what we're interested in my research group is other proteins of similar dimensions called collagen. And I will get to those in a moment. But first, I'd like to pose a question to you. And that is, if we wanted to study a protein of these sorts of size scales, so we're talking about nanometer widths and a few hundred nanometers in length, say, can we see that? So could we use a light microscope and obtain an image like this of the protein? Well, the answer would be no, it's too small. It's smaller than what's called the diffraction limit of light. And so we need other technologies to start to see things at this small size scale. If we could form them into crystals, we could use shoot x-rays at the crystals and learn from x-ray diffraction about the structures. Or if we could stain them somehow, we might use beams of electrons to investigate their structure. But an alternative approach that's quite widely used for studying biological systems involves feeling, okay? And so if we think about that, what we wanna do is sense by touch. And so reading Braille is an example of how we might do that ourselves. Or if you are familiar with old technology, there's such a thing as a record player. And this was a device that you can still find. Um, it basically has a small needle that reads out um, the surface of a spinning disc and converts what it's feeling uh, to sound. And so if we were to zoom in, we would see that this record needle um, is actually uh, going along a corrugated uh, surface and these bumps are gonna make it vibrate at particular frequencies that then correspond to the sound that's produced. And so this was a way to listen to music before we all had smartphones and so on. So the idea is that this can be, as long as you can um, machine something or manufacture something down to the length scale of proteins, then imagine that we could feel them with this little tip, okay? So the dimensions are rather different. Here's a 150 micrometer scale bar, for example, and this is a two nanometer um, protein that we'd be wanting to sort of sense if we could put it on a surface. But uh, we can do that uh, by using a technique called an atomic force microscope or AFM. And here is an image of a, one of those sharp tips that is used on an AFM. And the radius down here, if you were to able to zoom in, you'd see this particular one has a, a radius of about eight nanometers. And smaller ones are also possible. And so the AFM is a technique that um, allows us to basically uh, resolve very small nanometer sized um, changes in surface topography and surface forces. This is what one of these instruments looks like. This is the one that we've used extensively in our research. And if we were to zoom into the sample region, what we see is there's a flat substrate. Um, that's where we would, the, the thing we would image or where we would deposit the proteins we're interested in. There's this sharp probe. And then there's what's called a cantilever, which is just something that bends and is very sensitive to the forces between the probe and the substrate. And so as this cantilever bends, there's a little mirror on the back of it that will cause a laser beam that's being deflected off of the back to shoot in different directions on a photodiode. And so picking up this position here, one can then learn about the forces that are at play on the surface. And the surface can be scanned in X and in Y so that one can obtain a two-dimensional map of the three-dimensional topography or force interactions or so on. And so, Here's a little gift that is uh, 
showing that type of idea in action where the sample is being translated. And every time the tip comes near the next pixel, it's uh, measuring the interaction and reading out the displacement or the height as a function of position. So doing this type of process, we then want to look at the structure of, of these proteins uh, uh, and their conformations. And so we can do this um, in this example. We're using the protein that we want to study, collagen, which I'll tell you more about in a moment. We put it onto a very flat substrate called mica. And an image that we obtain looks something like this on the left side. So each of these little yellow squiggly lines would be a single collagen protein. And um, the scale bar here gives you a sense of the scale. So they look like they're about 300 nanometers long, which turns out to be correct. The brightness gives you an idea of the height. For us, that's not so important. We have dried these onto a surface, so the height isn't really very meaningful. It's more that we can get the contour out of these and the shape of the backbone of the protein. And I'll tell you why that's of interest as well. Okay, so collagen is the protein we're interested in. What is collagen? Why are we studying it? Um, so collagen is a protein that makes up a lot of our connective tissues and holds us together. So at the molecular level, it's a triple helix. And I don't know how well this is coming through, but I have here in my hands a rubber tube model of collagen. It's got three chains that wrap around each other to form a right-handed helix. So this is kind of to give you a picture of the protein structure. Okay, so it's something long and triple helical. And it can assemble into higher order structures. So for example, like threads that assemble into rope, um, we can think about the threads as these triple helical proteins and the rope as the building blocks of our tissues. And so we can see that collagen is found in a wide range of tissues throughout our bodies. It forms materials with different properties. For example, in tendons, it's really fulfilling a rope-like structure uh, and rope-like um, function. In the skin, uh, it is more extensible, the, the way it's organized and the types of collagen. In our eyes, for example, the cornea, the way that this protein assembles is really remarkable because it gives us optical transparency while still providing that material property that holds the cornea together. And so a wide diversity of tissues are made out of the same type of protein, collagen. There are slightly different types of collagen found in different tissues, but they all have the same triple helical structure, okay? So we wanna understand what it is about the triple helical structure and the sequence or the um, exact organization of amino acid building blocks in this that gives rise to the properties of these higher order materials. And so collagen really is a tensile material, so it's a template for growing cells. And if we were to look at a couple of organs and take them out and photograph them, and then we do a trick where we remove all of the cells from these organs, we can see that they still have the same shape, the same structure, the same morphology. And that's because of this collagen and the so-called extracellular matrix that holds them together. So it's really important for giving form and function to our um, the important parts of our bodies. And collagen is actually this protein that I mentioned is a quarter to a third of the total protein in our body. So as a material sort of starting point and building block, it is the fundamental structural protein in our bodies. So we're interested in studying it and I am in a physics department. So we build tools of physics and we use approaches of physics and we want to learn about physical properties such as the mechanics of collagen. And if we think about why that might be of relevance, um, we can think about the different functions that collagen has in our bodies. And for example, that there's a lot of diseases that arise from changes to collagen. 
Um, and as a result of aging, right, our skin gets wrinkly and our bones break more easily and so on. Those are chemical changes in collagen resulting in mechanical changes. We also know that the extracellular matrix, the scaffold around our cells, has a really important role to play in communicating with cells and sending them signals about what to do. And the mechanics is really fundamental to what goes on there. And also, if we could learn the rules about how to make these different types of structures with different mechanical properties and different material properties out of collagen building blocks, we could then start to build better materials for um, rebuilding tissues or helping to design prosthetics and so on. There's also an awful lot of uh, money for collagen in the cosmetic industry um, where perhaps uh, they're not thinking as much about mechanics as we are, but the anti-aging industry is worth the hundreds of billions of dollars. And I think if we had solved anti-aging, we would all know it. So it is certainly an area open for development. Okay, so with that introduction, um, what my group is really interested in is taking these single collagen proteins out of higher order tissues and looking at their mechanical properties, either passively learning about the energy it takes, for example, to bend them by seeing at thermal, thermal environments how much flexibility do we observe, or more actively interrogating them by stretching them. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about that. I appreciate that you all may not be as fascinated by collagen as I am, but hopefully some of the physics of the techniques uh, comes through. So these are the two techniques we're going to be approaching um, to study this, one looking at bending flexibility and the other at response to force. So if we think about the bending flexibility of collagen, we could think about this triple helix and do we describe it as sort of cooked spaghetti or raw spaghetti, right? Something that's very rigid or something that's very flexible. And if we look in the literature, what we find is that people have been trying to answer this question for a long time with a variety of different techniques. And that depending on the technique they've used and their approaches and so on, they get a order of magnitude range in a quantity called the persistence length. The persistence length reflects how long along a chain do I travel and have my direction persist, okay? So if I'm like very floppy, like cooked noodles, then my direction along the chain backbone is gonna change frequently and I will have a short persistence length. Whereas if I have something that's quite rigid, like raw noodles, I am gonna walk along the chain and my tangent vector is gonna be correlated for a long time. And so then I would have a long persistence length, okay? So we don't know how flexible collagen is this fundamental building block of our tissues. So my lab set up to try to understand this and reconcile this. So um, we have this collagen protein, this triple helix. One thing that's really important for forming the triple helix is that the amino acids that make it up, these individual building blocks, have a repeating pattern. G, something, something, G, something, something, where G is glycine. So the smallest amino acid appears every third amino acid residue in each chain. And with this pattern, you can form a triple helix. So understanding the flexibility of these is important to a number of different fields. So one thing we wondered was in trying to reconcile these different values, we know that there are different types of collagen. They all have the same glycine, XY, glycine, XY pattern, but the Xs and Ys can be different. And these are associated with different types of tissues and expressed in different types of tissues. So the first question we wanted to answer was, how does the type of collagen uh, influence its flexibility? Are there differences between these? So they're found, for example, type one, which is the most common is found in tendons and bone and skin whereas um, type two is in cartilage, uh, type three is in more flexible tissues. We also see that there's differences, type two and three are homotrimers, meaning the three chains are all exactly chemically identical. Whereas in type one, you have two chains that are identical and one chain that's different. They all still have this 
GXY, GXY pattern. So we wanted to see, do any of these things matter to the flexibility? So my PhD student, Nahme Rezai, and an undergraduate student, Aaron Lyons, imaged a number of these different proteins from different sources with atomic force microscopy. And you can see they all look about the same length, these yellow squiggles, right? That's uh, the, the collagen proteins are all 300 nanometers long. But in order to quantify their flexibility, we need to develop some tools, analytical tools. So we have to do some image analysis software, first of all, to identify the chains and parameterize the backbones so that we can get coordinates out and do some analyses on them with different models from polymer physics. So Nakme developed a really nice algorithm she dubbed Smart Trace, where if you give the um, program some points that are close to your initial backbone, it can refine that and obtain the backbone coordinates of your protein. An undergraduate, Matthew Snyder, came in and said instead of clicking on buttons to find those locations, he was going to train a neural network to do so. And so that's what he did. And you can see that in action here, picking out and identifying uh, collagen chains from an AFM image. This one's been converted to grayscale. So we have a way now to get out the coordinates of the protein. And now we want to look at um, quantifying its flexibility. To do this, we use the worm-like chain model from polymer physics. And specifically, we're going to be looking at its bending, and so its bending persistence length. So we can extract that if we have coordinates of a chain, because what we can do is take two points that are separated by some distance s along the contour of the molecule, this curved backbone, and we can ask how far apart are they in our two-dimensional space on the surface, that's r. And so we look at the average r squared. And we can look at how much did the um, tangent vector reorient along this distance s. So in other words, the correlation between these two tangent vectors separated by a distance s. And the worm-like chain model predicts that the tangent vector correlation falls off as cos theta um, with this, which is given by cos theta, the dot product, it falls off uh, exponentially with the distance traveled along the backbone with the length scale set by persistence length. And this R squared uh, through space distance squared also depends on S, the distance along the contour, and P, the persistence length. So we see that the model fits, shown in solid lines on these two plots, describe the data that we measure, which are shown by the open circles with error bars, quite well. And not only that, but reassuringly, the values agree. Um, we are getting a persistence length of around 100 nanometers uh, for our collagen sample. So this value is kind of right in the middle of the range of reported values that, that went from about 10 nanometers to 170 nanometers. With the 300 nanometer contour length of collagen from one end to the other, this means you can consider it kind of roughly rigid along a third of its contour length. So that means that it's semi-flexible or semi-rigid. So remember, I wanted to look at the different types of collagen and their sources to see if that mattered to this value of persistence length. And what we find is that it doesn't make a strong difference. So all of these three are roughly centered around 90 nanometers or so. There may be some differences among them that are subtle, but overall, we're not seeing the same range of persistence lengths as was reported in the literature from 170 down to about 10. Okay, so they all seem to cluster in the middle, suggesting that regardless of the type of collagen, um, it's a semi-flexible chain. Okay, so um, that was looking at collagens that have a continuous type of sequence, this glycine XY repeating pattern. There are other collagens in our tissues that um, don't form the same type of rope-like higher order structures. And in fact, they form networks instead. And type four collagen is an example of this. It's found in the kidney, lining the kidney. It forms a sort of um, mesh that helps to act as a filtration barrier. 
And so we wanted to see what the effect was of this different type of collagen. So in contrast to the collagens that I've told you about so far that form these so-called fibrils, of which we've depicted a kind of cross section here that make long rope-like structures by very organizingly packing side by side, type four collagen forms looser networks and doesn't tend to bundle side by side. So um, current PhD student and former undergraduate student, Ala Alshire in the lab, she decided to image type four collagens. And you can see them in this AFM image. They have a blob on one end, I've, as I've showed in the schematic, but you can also see that bright dot in the image here. And so that gives us a marker for one end of the protein. And you can see that in some cases they come together end to end and assemble these these head to head assemblies and that's part of their higher order structure assembly. So there are some images we can also trace them and do the same worm like chain analysis of their properties and what Ala found is that this um, type four collagen is considerably more flexible than the other ones. Okay, so its persistence length is 40 nanometers versus around 90, 90 nanometers or so. So this is interesting to us because if we're thinking about the material properties of these proteins and using them as building blocks, the first four collagens here all like to assemble side by side laterally and form long thick bundle structures and they have a high persistence length. Whereas the mouse, uh, the type four collagen, this has these interruptions in the GLI XY sequence. It forms more flexible, has more flexible backbones, and it doesn't bundle. Instead, it forms networks. Okay, so we wanted to see if uh, something about this glycine XY, glycine XY pattern um, was responsible for this difference in the bending stiffness or the persistence lengths. So type four collagen has gaps in that pattern where you'll still have a continuous chain, but it won't be this glycine XY, glycine XY. It'll be maybe glycine XY, Z, X, Z, glycine XY, glycine XY. Okay, so there's interruptions. So the question is, do those act as sort of hinge regions that in, impart flexibility to the protein? So what Ala did was take the images of collagens and uh, uh, look at as a function of the distance from this globular end, look locally at different regions and say, how flexible is the collagens, say 50 nanometers at a point 50 nanometers away from that end and plot that. And 100 nanometers away, let's look at 100 nanometers away in hundreds of chains and how flexible is it there? And so she's mapping out the bending flexibility as a function of the position along the backbone. Okay, I'm, I don't have time to go into exactly how we do this, but I'm happy to answer questions about that if you're interested. So what we can see is in this um, sequence dependent or position dependent flexibility profile, we have a wide range of flexibilities of the individual protein ranging from higher values that are more rigid to shorter values where regions far from this globular end appear far more flexible, okay? They bend really easily. And you can see that in the images, right? They look more squiggly out here than they do close to the blob. So we can align the sequence of collagen with this pattern in order to try to learn more. Because one thing that we noticed was that the peak values we're getting are about the same as what we found for the collagens that have a continuous triple helix. So when we look at the sequence and the overlap, what I'm showing here is a schematic representation of the sequence of each of the three chains. And what Ala has done is everywhere where you have this pattern, glycine XY, glycine XY, she's drawn a thick rectangle. Okay, so this region here, there's a long stretch in these two chains that has this pattern, and there's a long stretch in the third chain that also has this pattern. But wherever you see a, a narrow line, 
that's a region of the chain that doesn't have this pattern, and it's what we call an interruption. Okay, so we might be going glycine, XY, glycine, XY, glycine, XY, and then Z, A, B, Z, A, glycine, XY, glycine, XY. All right. And you can see that in some of the chains, we have interruptions that all align. And in other regions, we'll have an interruption in one chain and not in the others, uh, or vice versa. And so what we can see when we look at this, oops, is that these regions where the flexibility matches that of the triple helix are regions of the protein sequence where all three chains have this, inter this um, triple helix forming sequence and a long stretch of it. Whereas where we see dips in this uh, bending flexibility, those correlate with regions where all three chains have an overlapping interruption, okay? And down here towards the end of the triple of the collagen four, where we have really high flexibility, we see there's lots and lots of breaks in this uh, glycine XY pattern. And so we really think this is a way that um, nature has evolved to encode mechanical stiffness in proteins is through this repetitive pattern that kind of locks in a more stable triple helical structure and through flexibility, if when it needs hinges or needs to be able to have more flexible regions, it can have breaks in that pattern. And interestingly, this type of collagen with all of these interruptions was the first to arise through evolution, okay? And then only later did the proteins with the continuous glycine XY evolve and they have turned to be the more dominant proteins in our bodies as functional. Okay, so that's a little bit of insight into the bending flexibility. We've done a lot of other work, and I'd encourage you, if you're interested, to check out our website and get the references such as those mentioned on the slide here. Um, but what I'd like to do now is switch gears and tell you about another approach to studying the mechanical properties on the nanoscale. So the first part, we were using EFM, and we were doing this touching when you cannot see and feeling for the proteins on the surface and then using these techniques from physics to understand the flexibility and try to relate that to their composition. In the second part, I'm going to tell you about more active experiments where we take the collagen and we stretch it by its ends and we ask what happens when it's under load. How does its structure change when we are pulling on it? And if we think back to the picture of collagen holding us together, we can realize that we're often loading our proteins. So in this tendon, for example, which is a, you can think of as the rope made up of these collagen threads, every time we take a step, our muscles contract, they pull on this tendon and stretch it. Not very much because it's really stiff, but it's being loaded. So our collagen in our tissues is constantly under load, cyclic load, getting stretched, relaxed, stretched, relaxed, stretched, relaxed. And so if we'd like to understand um, how the local environment impacts the function, and we want to understand how is it that collagen can withstand these repeated load cycles, and does the application of repeated load influence its ability to be targeted for um, remodeling and keeping our tissues healthy, we'd like to understand these properties as a function of force. Okay, so here, for example, is sort of a schematic showing this hierarchical structure of a tendon from the triple helix on up. And if we think about pulling on a tendon or zooming in to pulling on a collagen protein, we can think about three possible outcomes that happen. And I'm gonna talk about relatively low forces, but forces that are typical for the molecular scale in biology, which are on the order of piconewtons. Okay, so 10 to the minus 12 newtons. If you take a, apply force to our triple helix, what could happen? 
Well, the middle option is no change, right? Maybe we've just got some flexibility like we saw in our AFM images and all we're doing with piconewton scale forces is kind of straightening the backbone, but we're not changing it structurally. Alternatively, um, we could be, as we stretch it, tightening the chain or stabilizing the chain, bringing the three individual components of that helix closer together, making it um, more structurally stable and able to withstand attack by other things. Or it could be that as we pull it, we're actually loosening the connections between the chain. Maybe we're unwinding it slightly, coupling to that torsional degree of freedom, or maybe we're just forcing the chains out of register. So if we look to the literature to see what is known about this, what we see is that we've had, again, there is some confusion about what might be going on. Different studies revealing different things. So um, the studies that have been done at the single molecule level that have involved pulling on the collagen used um, specialized scissors, molecular scissors, they're called uh, enzymes that can cut collagen. And they, these two groups, the Ruberti lab from Northeastern University and the Dunn lab from Stanford University um, used proteases or these scissors that have evolved to cut collagen. And um, so collagen aces. And one group found that with the bacterial collagen aces, uh, they found that as they pulled on the collagen, they decreased the ability of these protein scissors to cut it. Whereas a different collagenase, one that's obtained, found in humans, for example, was able to cut the chains more rapidly when force was applied, suggesting that force was destabilizing the triple helix. So we thought, okay, these proteins that they've used have evolved to deal with triple helical collagen. Can we use a probe that's a little bit more inert uh, in the sense that it should, it, it's not specialized for collagen? And my former PhD student, Mike Kirkness, proposed that we should use trypsin. So trypsin is another protease. So it's a, basically, it's an enzyme that can cut chains of proteins. Now, what's unique about this is if you think about it being a pair of scissors or something, it can't fit the triple helix into its scissors. It, it, they can't open wide enough. They can only fit single chains, okay? So what this means is trypsin cannot cut triple helical collagen. And only if we destabilize it somehow, maybe by heating it or adding chemicals, or in our case, if it destabilizes when we pull on it, then we will see um, that it can cut it. And trypsin has been used for decades as a probe of triple helical structure. And so Mike said, let's use that in these assays and see what happens. So when we stretch collagen, the question is, do we see trypsin cutting it faster? If so, that suggests that the triple helix must be destabilizing when it's cut because trypsin needs to have it destabilized to access it. Whereas if when we add the trypsin, we don't see any cutting by the enzyme, that the collagen remains uh, intact, then that suggests that it's one of these possibilities. Okay. So to do these experiments, we have to be able to grab onto and pull these nanometer scale structures. So how do we do that? So one way would be to use chemistry and um, label the ends of the collagen and then tether it between a surface and a bead, a microscopic bead that we could see in a microscope. What's nice is if we do this with a whole bunch of these, we can look in our microscope field of view and see all of these different black dots is each one black bead that is attached to this cover slip in our microscope by a collagen protein. And if we use these beads that are heavy, denser than water, 
then there will be a gravitational force pulling them down. Okay, so gravity pulling down. And so now we're exerting force. And what's nice is we can see a whole lot of these in our experiment at once. And so what we could do is measure the kinetics of the rate at which these beads disappear from the field of view because they are getting um, cut by the trypsins. The problem is that if we wanted to exert a different amount of force, we would need to use a different size of beads or a different density of beads in order to have a different gravitational force. And that means we'd have to do even more surface chemistry, which we don't like having to do. Uh, it would also mean that uh, in general, the forces that we could access are not gonna be super large because the gravitational forces on these microspheres relative to the displaced water are not that big either. An alternative approach would be to take this same sample and now instead of just using gravity to spin it, to, to pull on it, we spin the sample, right? And if we spin it faster, then we get a higher force. So omega here is the angular acceleration. Mass is the mass of each sphere relative to displaced water. And R is the arm, arm length of this rotation. So centripetal acceleration to the rescue. This is the basis for the first centrifuge force microscope that was proposed and demonstrated by Ken Halverson and Wesley Wong back uh, over 10 years ago now. And so uh, Mike and I saw this and thought, ooh, this would be fun. This first uh, generation instrument that they built had a meter long piece of metal that was acting as the arm and they were rotating this on a big optical table. Mike had the idea to put this instead into a centrifuge, which is a commercial instrument that many labs in molecular biology have, and let the centrifuge do the spinning. And so this is a nice schematic by a current PhD student in my group, Koshik Bar, um, showing the idea. So basically you have these buckets that spin around in this instrument and inside of each bucket, you have a little microscope and the microscope then can look at your sample of collagen tethered to the surface with these beads and then record what's going on, okay? So essentially what we're doing is we miniaturize a I like a bright field microscope and then we spin it <laughs> and we need to build this in a way that the focal plane and the optics in the microscope are not affected by these very high spinning speeds and forces. And we need to build it in a way that we can read out what the camera is seeing um, when we're sitting beside the centrifuge. So Mike uh, Kirkness built the first generation of this in the lab. Koshik's working on the second generation. And here's a picture of the centrifuge with these buckets. And so we just simply plop this in one of them. Here's a closer up view of the microscope with a schematic showing what's in here. It's a very simple microscope. It has a LED for illumination, an objective lens for imaging, and then a camera. And in this case, we have a camera that sends an analog signal, an RF signal with radio frequencies, and we can pick that up with this receiver that's just sitting outside of the spinning bucket. And then that's connected to the computer. The LED and the camera are both battery operated. So this whole thing is completely portable. We don't have to have wires going in or anything else. So this took a little bit of machining for Mike to, to get working and, um, has shown that it can withstand pretty high accelerations up to about 1,000 times G and uh, stay with a stable imaging plane. The cost of this instrument was about $500 for this microscope that is so mechanically robust. So it's a pretty accessible type of technology. I mean, you do need to have a centrifuge uh, to put it into, but for us, we borrowed one from down the hall in biology. Uh, Koshik is making the next generation one and he's got the cost down to $200. That includes some temperature control. So we're pretty excited about that. So um, here's the idea. 
right? We take this, we put it in the centrifuge. These buckets, they spin up. When this starts spinning, they go horizontal. So you're really pushing the force is, is sort of in this radial direction. And so a question that I have for you, and I guess you could think about wherever you are when you're viewing this, is which of these do you think has the highest acceleration? Our little centrifuge force microscope, someone doing the luge, uh, which may not be common in parts of the world where you are, but it's a very fun uh, race to watch. I would not want to do it. Uh, the, a rocket at launch, like the space shuttle, or race cars going around the, the corner of a racetrack. So if you think about that, turns out that um, our CFM wins by far. So we have a, demonstrated that it can maintain a stable imaging plane up to a thousand times G. For a human body, you normally want to have uh, about five Gs of force. There's about the maximum the human body can withstand. It can be a little bit higher transiently. So this space shuttle is 3G. The NASCAR is generally 3G. For the car racing, it can be up to about 5Gs at the, at the turns. And luge is actually higher than that. It's usually 5Gs at the turns. But we're 200 times more g-force than that with this little microscope for 500 bucks and now 200 dollars. so let's look what happens in the experiment right so we have our cover glass and we've got our beads kept, uh, attached by collagens and we put trips in these protein scissors in the solution as well and we're going to be watching a video that uh, is recorded while this is spinning at um, 1,000 RPM, roughly, rotate revolutions per minute. And so you're seeing what the microscope sees. And if these trips and scissors can cut the collagen, then what we expect to see is the beads disappearing uh, from the field of view. Because once the, this chain gets cut, they can the beads are released, and they're going to be pulled very rapidly to the other side of the chamber where they'll be out of focus. So let's see what happens. Um, this movie is shown in about uh, at 10 times real time so that you can see this in a, a good amount of time here. Hopefully what you can see is that over time, we are losing beads from the surface of the chamber. So this is suggesting that what we're able to pick up is the cutting of individual nanometer scale proteins in real time and that this is happening under a force of nine picoNewtons. So something is changing, it is making this accessible to force, okay? So we can look before and after, so 20 minutes after we start, so the bottom here, nine picoNewtons of force, 20 minutes later, most of the beads have gone. If we do the exact same experiment, just sitting on a microscope in the, in the lab without any force beyond the very small 80 pico, or femtonewtons from gravity, we see not very many beads have uh, been lost, suggesting that trypsin is not cleaving very much at low force, but it's cleaving much more at high force. We can count the fraction of beads remaining as a function of time and fit that and see that indeed the force is uh, drastically increasing the rate of cleavage. We wanted to make sure this wasn't due just to ripping these off the surface with force, but it was actually due to the trypsin cutting the chains. And so we did the same experiments without trypsin, which are shown with the open circles. We see there is some detachment of the chains, but the rate is much slower than with the trypsin under force. And so we could correct for this to find the trypsin dependent rate and determine that it seems that the effect of this nine piconewtons of force is to enhance the rate of collagen cleavage about 20 fold. So pull on collagen, it's 20 times more easy for it to get cut than when we're not pulling on it. So that suggests that the triple helix is loosening uh, when we apply force to it, which is consistent with some of the previous experiments. We think that discrepancy may be due to the regions of the triple helix that are targeted by these different enzymes. 
Uh, but I'm not going to get into the details of that now. Okay. I also note that while you're doing single molecule observations, this technique allows us extremely high throughput and gives us the ability to count thousands of individual events, which has been unheard of in any single molecule experiment that preceded this. If we look at the implications of this response in the higher order structures, here's an experiment that was done on a part of a tendon. And they've actually taken this part of the tendon and folded it around in these images so it's easier to see. But what they did was they, they stretched it, um, part of it by the ends, and then saw what happened at different amounts of strain. And they used a dye to label it afterwards that is sensitive to how, dis, how uh, perturbed the triple helical structure is. So going from 5 to 10 to 15 percent strain, you see it getting a lot brighter, meaning there's been a lot more disturbing of the triple helical structure of collagen. And they also looked at the percent digested by trypsin and found that it corresponded and increased at the same rate. So we think this means that uh, what we're seeing at the single molecule level is can be translated into the higher order structures and is consistently telling us that as we pull collagen fibers and strain them, that the triple helical structure, this fundamental building block, can be destructed with a high amount of strain. Okay, so um, what I hope I've shared with you today is a little bit of information about collagen as this building block that's responsive to um, different conditions such as force. And I hope from the physics standpoint that I've told you a little bit about how physics really plays into this, helping us to develop image analysis algorithms, statistical analyses, and building new instruments. And um, all of the work that I've told you about has really been led by students in the group, past and present uh, students listed here. And here's a picture of us at a local biophysics event last summer. And I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Okay, well, thank, thank you for your interesting and exciting uh, lecture. So I have got two questions in the uh, inbox. So first is, what is the role of uh, collagen and uh, the similar question another is how collagen depends on force mm -hmm. so how what sorry what specific uh, question about force i'm not so, so how collagen uh, depends on force yeah so collagen does have this triple helical structure at the protein level and i think what we found through the last part of the um, work that I talked about is that when you stretch the triple helix, it's destabilizing that triple helical structure. So we don't know the mechanism. We're working on that. Um, it could be that in our experiments, when we stretch, we're also unwinding a little bit. And so torsion and strain are coupled. But it could also be that there we don't need the torsion. It could just be that they're getting the forces applying that we apply kind of shifts these slightly out of register, doesn't make them lock together so well. And that's what's allowing the trypsin to access and cut these chains more easily uh, when we stretch it. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, so I have one question mm -hmm. uh, so on the behalf of my students. So if, uh, if any student uh, who completed uh, his or her uh, bachelor degree in physics. So can he or she join biophysics group and how or uh, biological physics group and, and how, what she or he need to do if- Yeah, uh, that's- Join your group. Right, um, absolutely. So my group, uh, I could use the people here as an example. We're really interdisciplinary. So um, there are two physics graduate students shown here. So Koshik, who is um, from near Kolkata, he has okay. a background in physics. And he okay. came into the lab knowing very little about biology, but with a passion for learning. Luis is from Costa Rica. And he also came into the lab with a background in physics and sort of material science, uh, some nanoscale work 
but also no real experience with biological systems. And so the two of them, look, they're smiling. They're happy to be learning about biophysics. Uh, we train them. We, we, they, are, they now are able to make DNA by a technique called PCR in the lab. They're learning surface chemistry and so on. Um, so they are, uh, I think, for students in my lab, it's, I like to see that there's some concept of what biophysics is and why it's interesting because you really do have to get into a new language <laughs> to learn the biology. You don't have to learn everything about biology, but you have to be willing and curious to learn it. And then, uh, but you don't have to know it all. I, I knew nothing about biology when I started in the field of biophysics, but uh, so I know it can be done. Okay, madam, thank you. Uh, thanks again for giving us this opportunity. So I think, uh, so if we can arrange uh, this webinar face to face, as you have uh, told me earlier that you're interested to visit our part. So I'll be very happy and we will be very happy to host you. So thanks again, madam. Yes. Thanks for the opportunity. It's my pleasure, madam. Have a nice okay. day. Bye. Bye. -bye.